Hi right, guys, and welcome to another video. Now, this is quite an exciting video. Um, I feel this is something that's going to really going to benefit a lot of people. And this is hopefully going to be like a little series. So this is going to be like real stories. We're going to get a chance to talk to dog handlers, hopefully going to get some trainers, maybe some business owners, and you'll get a better look at the, at the, company, at the way dog handlers uh, are run and the way that maybe people behind the scenes that you, you don't see from my point of view. Um, today, we've got Aaron from UK Security 101. Um, I've, been speaking, I've been speaking to Aaron for a while, and um, he is really knowledgeable. He's got five years, is it five years in the security industry? Yeah, five years. Well, five yeah. years dog handling, but 10 years in security. Yep, that's the one. So I feel like you've got a, you've got a, a much more broader experience to dog handling than probably I have. Um, I've said before that I think we've both been in security for the same amount of time, but I've been in sort of the system side now into dog handling. What were you doing before the last five years of dog handling? Um, so I jumped through a various of different jobs. So I started off, as most of us do, um, doing door work. Uh, I was 18 years old. I was doing door work, site work, door work. And then I went into doing some specialised jobs like uh, prisoner transport, cash and transit, um, jumped back into the door work. And then I've just sort of moved around the industry and went up to do uh, close protection for a period of time um, after coming out of the military and then went into dog handling. Mm -hmm. So we could obviously tell from from the accent that you're from, from Liverpool. Um, <laughs> You're now down in sort of the southwest. Yeah. Yes. Um, so, wait, so, wait, so, how long have you been down in the southwest? Then is that recent or? Uh, well, it's it's a bit of an odd one, really, because um, I, for a period of my life, I lived down here for three years previous, um, and I went back up to back up north uh, to work, and then ended up coming back down here just because I generally like it down here. But it's just it's a more peaceful way of life, and especially if you're a dog handler. Living in a city is quite a nightmare when you've got obviously a trained dog with you and you've got to be so careful about everything and everyone around you or people getting offended or scared, being scared of the dog. Whereas down here, everyone's dog friendly. Everyone loves dogs. So it's, it's a sort of, it was a lifestyle choice. Down, down like Southwest, because I've been down there and not so, not so much since I've been doing this work, but obviously just being down there is it, where you can go to like the beach and you can have the dog off leads and because the beaches are yeah yeah there's a there's, there's a really big community sorry if i talked over you by the way um yeah there's a really big community down here with um with dogs like literally you can't walk down a street every day without seeing a dog like you you will see four or five dogs on one on one road you know you will get lit i get licked to death I'm, I'm like the dog whisperer for my neighbors every dog on this street knows me yeah. so yeah it's a it's a really good a good place um, for dog handlers because you, you, you're more accepted as well. Um, I, I found the community down here really appreciate what I do. Weirdly enough, um, they find it quite reassuring that I live in this community because they feel safer. So yeah, yeah, I, I find that I find that a little bit because um, where I've moved to now, um, we're obviously in a in a not a block of flats. So like we're like three lock apartments and. When um, <coughs> I, when I first met the people and I said like what I did etc, they actually felt a bit safer because they know on the bottom floor there's this security dog and I said to them look no one's ever gonna try and break in, and, uh, <laughs> no one's gonna get within like twenty yards of the place without anyone knowing. So even like the the floors above us, although I have an alarm uh, for my place obviously when the dog's not here etc, um, th then the the people in the in the apartments above feel so much safer with the dog actually here than, than if he wasn't. So they're like, no, that's fine, because like, that's security sorted. So, yeah, I, I, I get what you mean, like people around and pe probably like neighbours, things like that, they probably are more appreciative of the dog more than they are worried about about the dog being there. So Yeah, what I find down here especially as well, I'm, it's probably the same in your area, um, is that when you like the initial when people meet you and see that you're a security dog and a security dog and they automatically think fierce dog on a lead you know chainsaw on a lead we've we've spoke about this before um, and what you'll find is that when you actually sit down and explain to them what we do what the dogs are trained to do and how we do it often the times is that these people actually just sort of realize and take it in and go gee we did not know that like we had no idea that you guys go through that much. 
mm-hmm. to get to where you are, you know, to yeah. do your job. Yeah, and, that, and that, that's I've said this many a times. And if 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 my channel makes anything, obviously I want to help people get into the industry and that. But if this if my channel helps the public to understand what we do, how we do it, the training that we go through, I feel that that's probably more beneficial than it is kind of helping people into the industry because it just helps the, the people that are in it and the people that get into it. I just hope that it makes us more accepted and people understand it a bit more. So yeah, that's like I say, that's that's like the hope of the channel as well as helping people to, to sort of get into it. So the first question I have is what made you get into dog handling? Well, this is an easy answer. And it's probably not the most, probably not the uh, the best answer, but my two stupid older brothers. <laughs> right. um, both my older brothers are former military, and both of them are now security dog handlers. Well, one's retired from security dog handling, now a mechanic. One's still a dog handler who actually works in the same area I do, so we still work together. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> how, how is that? How is that working? How is that working with a family member? Is that is it is it easy? Uh, do you know what? It's um, it's because we were all in the military together as well. Uh, it's we've got a bond that's unbreakable. It's like I know if I call call him up or if they call me up, they know if if there's anything ever anything happening, whether it's something wrong with my missus, something wrong with my dog, something wrong with me, they will drop what they're doing and, and they're coming. They're coming to back me up hundred percent. And that's nice, um, it's just a nice thing to know. So your so your choice of breed now. Obviously, we know there's Dobermans, Rottweilers, Malinois, German Shepherds. They're sort of the recognised ones by Nasdaq. Are you Nasdaq or are you? Uh, I'm Nip Two. So is it is, is it the sim is it the same breeds that you can do that or is or with that? Yeah, yeah, there? yeah. So basically, um, Nasdaq, Nip Two, and Bipter, they all have like the uh, national standard breed. So all the breeds are the same categorized throughout each each um each part they're basically just mirror image, images of each other in in that case but in training wise we do things slightly differently right okay it's anything anything that really stands out in terms of uh, um so, a little examples like for example when you say um security dog and handler stay where you are we say security officer with a trained dog stand still right okay Little thing, just little thing, little little niggly things that get changed in like weirdness. Like for example, when you say "come out" or "I'm sending the dog to find you," we say "come out now" or "we're bringing the dog in to find you." Mm-hmm. Okay, so it's just it's the yeah. same thing, but just worded slightly different. But that could, but weirdness. that could also, but that could also be maybe different trainers putting it different ways, things like that. So it can. I, it, it, uh, it, it's one of them things with the um, with the industry, and it's 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 hard to police what we do in regards to training because it does not matter whether you go to NAS if you could go to a NASDU trainer and go to another NASDU trainer and the training would still be different. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's that's the you know that's the part we haven't got a border where all of us are doing the exact same training. Yeah it's, 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 yeah, it's it's not like you it's not like you're just reading out of a book. Like when I done my SI SIA license, although you do have little chats, it's literally they're reading the the book word for word so you know that everyone that's gone through that course has had exactly the same thing said to them when it comes to dog training but i think that comes down to obviously different dogs being needed being needed to talk being taught different ways as well yeah so um, um right so getting back to that so you've obviously got the four breeds what what breed do, do you have uh, i have a german shepherd cross dutch header Right. Is it is it a Dutch herd or is it a Dutch? Can you call it a Dutch shepherd as well? Or is that? Um, well, it's one of that. I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit unsure about this one because I'm pretty sure that a Dutch. Um, so you've got a Dutch herd and a Dutch shepherd. I'm pretty sure a Dutch shepherd and a Dutch herd are actually two separate dogs. Right. OK. Um, because I have seen something called a Dutch shepherd that looked nothing like a Dutch herder. Yeah, because I was just wondering, I was just wondering, because obviously people call them German shepherds and Alsatians. They're just exact, they're exactly the same dog. Yeah, there's no um, difference, the exact same dog. Yeah, yeah but I've, for, for, I've, from what I've heard, the reason that we, that people call them Alsatians is that in World War II, we refused to call them German shepherds because obviously, because of the German part of it. So they called them Alsatians. So they're actually exactly the same dog, but... Some people like some people see my dog and they say, oh, "Is that an Alsatian or a German Shepherd?" And you're like, "Yes, yeah, that's exactly the same." I, I get, 
Yeah, I get that question a lot. And you know the amount of time it's you know it, it's brilliant because it's like um it's like opening a book when they say that to you because it's like you're someone who doesn't know anything about dogs. Yeah. <laughs> so is it so is how, how old is your dog? Is it obviously is it your first dog or is it yeah, yeah, he's my first. Yeah, he's my first dog. He's five and a half. He's actually snoring his head away now in the corner. <laughs> Obviously, we've just come off for a, a, a night shift, guys. So bear with me. I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, no, I, I should have mentioned that at the start. Obviously, I appreciate that you're just coming off shift, so I appreciate you staying up to uh, to do this with us. So, um, in terms of uh, vehicle, now, obviously, I know some people have uh, vans, some people have cars, some people. Like have a small van, a transit. What what do you have? Right. So when it's it's a bit difficult now because I have a company issue vehicle now. Um, the vehicle I have is a Ford Transit Custom, and it's mm-hmm. an X. Uh, it was an X meat like a or what we call them meat wagons, the paddy wagons. It was an X. Uh, police lock up van, lock up van for the police. Uh, okay. um, so the back's been converted into a full cage system and then there's storage up, up top. So I'm currently using that at the moment and it, it's good. Don't get me wrong. It's terrible on fuel. Thank God I have a fuel card because I'd be bankrupt. <laughs> if my boss is watching, he knows exactly what I mean. Um, so yeah, I would not be paying to go to work and now put it that way. Um, but um, So when I first started off, I actually started with a 2005 Ford Transit Connect. Um, it was just because I, it's what I could afford. Um, it was pretty good on fuel. The engines were bulletproof on them cars because they were the older models. Um, so they hardly ever got any mechanical faults. And I think it's it's down to preference, really, on what you're doing as a job. Um, it's like being a dog handler, you know, it is one job, but there's so many different routes you could do. Like you could be static somewhere just doing a patrol once every hour, or you could be out constantly throughout the night on mobile patrols. So it's really dependent on the job and the person. Um, personal advice to anyone for, for vehicles is, and I've said this in one of my other videos, um, I think it was the five things to invest in, is a, a state car or people carrier and just look for the best fuel economy because at the end of the day, the car is meant to make you money. It's not meant to take you money. I've, I've, I had my car at the start and now I've got my van and I've, I must admit having the van and because I've, I found that in, in a car, you end up with everything on your back seats. And then if you want to go out for the day, you have to clear everything out and, and things like that. I've always I've found that having the van and lumping it all in the back and having it all hung up has, has been much more beneficial. But like I say, I understand with what you're saying about fuel economy, because like you don't want to be spending loads of money getting getting to work. I mean, I've seen people with like X5s as 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 like dog handler cars. I'm thinking to myself, like you're just wasting money. Like as you're driving down the road, the banknotes are coming out the exhaust. But yeah, I suppose the only good thing about it is, though, if you get quite a local job, like if I, when you drive there, most of the time that's it. You park your van up, it's there for 12, 15 hours and things like that. But I understand what you mean about getting something with good fuel economy because a lot of these, um, a lot of jobs that you'll get maybe like 30, 40 mile away and you don't want to be wasting money trying to get there. And obviously with a lot of places now with the... Um, the new emissions thing where you need the ad blue, like getting a van that's got the ad blue. So I know that if I go to London, I haven't got to pay for that. I don't need it around here, but I know that if I do have to go to London, I'm not wasting money on having to pay for an emission thing in there as well. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you, you, you know, obviously you've got all that happening as well. The other thing as well with the vehicles, for example, like my, my personal vehicle at the moment, um, I sometimes use it for work, obviously if I'm not using the company vehicle, um, for whatever reason, services or whatever, um, I've got a, a Skoda Fabia Estate, one of the one of the older models. Now, most people would look at that car and think you can't, you couldn't use that for a dog car. I'll, I'll be honest, mate, fantastic. I'm getting probably about sixty six to seventy miles per gallon out of it. Mm. Um, so the fuel economy is great, but there is so much space inside you; it's unreal. All the back seats fold down completely flat. You can even remove them. You can easily fit a dog cage in there. Honestly, fantastic car, but you would not, you wouldn't expect it. Um, so, 
go moving on from that, what what is your favourite piece of equipment? Now I know with UK Security One Hundred and One, you are going to do you do product reviews for different pieces of equipment, and I know you've got some good ideas for for videos to do like reviews, things like that. So you yeah. are the man for equipment, basically. But if you could pick, let let's pick out a top three because I know you've got loads of equipment. Pick out like your top three favourite pieces of equipment. Um, I think the top one would be straight away, and I've probably mentioned this to you before, body armour. Just straight away, top top one of the list for everyone. And, you know, a lot of people wouldn't agree with that, but we'll go into that in a minute. Um, so, yeah, body armour. Um, I think the next really good flashlight, good torch. Um, I always obviously go by the rule is two is one and one is none. Um, so I'll always carry three on me. I have a head torch, a small torch, and then a full search torch. Um and the third one, um, my third one would probably be restraints, actually, um, handcuffs or um, physical restraints, um, just because at the end of the day, you know, you aim not to use them. I, and I do aim not to use them. But it's nice to know they're there when you're completely isolated and done on your own and you've got no choice but to deal with someone who's being violent. So with, uh, with, with restraints, is that because you've done your door supervisor licence? No, so with restraints, you can actually go and do a separate course, like the the plastered all over the internet. It's only like a one or two day course, and then you can go and do refresh training. The cert- certification lasts for a year, and then you've got to redo it every year. Um, and what it is basically, handcuffs are a common law use of force, so any civilian can carry handcuffs. It's only because we're using them in in the form of a work purpose that we have to have specific training on them, and they have to. Be- fit for purpose and also meet health and safety regulations so you'll find that nearly all of us use uh, ridge cuffs the same as the police because the police go through a lot of scrutiny with what they use as handcuffs as well yeah so if the police are standards is ridge cuffs then we use the same standard because then we obviously we can't get done over for health and safety issues and stuff yeah. like that Okay, well, that, that, that's interesting because obviously I know like <laughs> thought supervisor, you do like confrontation stuff and kind of thought, kind of like that sort of stuff for like being a bouncer or at nightclubs or whatever it is. And I'd be, I'd be completely honest with you, mate. Honestly, right. I'm telling you now, I'm, 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 I, I, honestly, there'll be hundreds of people out there that agree with me. You do a door supervisor's course, what they teach you, you will never, ever use, ever. It, honestly, you will you will end up with your face in the ground with a broken nose if you used any of the stuff they tried to teach you. Um, is it, it is it kind of like is it kind of like PC combat? So you, it's sort of combat, but the nice way of doing it. And if you oh, no, 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 uh, someone knows uh, what they're I'll doing. Out the last the last the last time I the last time I went there to do like, do, um, like some re up training and stuff like that, they had this thing where like you can't. You can't be aggressive. You can't be aggressive in the tone of voice. You've got to politely ask them to leave and guide them out by their arm and slowly walk them to the door. And I said, yeah, what about the other arm that's punching me in the face? <laughs> you know, it's it's, yeah, it's just to, unbelievable. It, it really do, is. Trying to do that at one o'clock in the morning with someone that's had 18 Jager bombs and six bottles of beer is, is not exactly, it, yeah. it's not how the world works, is it? No, it's not. And um, or the other one is, I would say, you need a minimum of three door staff to remove a person going down the stairs. And it's just like, yeah, most door sta- most places only have two door staff. So how's that gonna work? Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Freaking hell! Some of the places I've worked, you only had one. <laughs> so obviously, this is obviously this is a serious job. And there are serious things that happen, but there's also a lighter side of it. And what what would you say is your funniest moment dog handling? So is there like a funny whether it, it can be training, it can be working, it can be working with other people? What's what is your funniest moment dog handling? I actually had, I actually had to think about this one, and um, I was actually talking to my brother about this last night, and uh, but me and him, me well three of us were working on a, a contract together. Um, it was in a big massive industrial site, so it was like multiple businesses. Um, and we had a big uh, Toyota Hilux, like, and it was all marked up. Um, so we, we patrolled around the that. So we pu- we pulled into one of this bu- this business. I won't name the business, obviously. And um, we pulled into this business, and all the workers are still working around. It's the evening, but they work late into the night. So they're all walking around, and we had a lot of like rattling coming from the back of the uh, where where the cab is, where the cages are. And it's like, well, the dogs are in cages, so what's moving around? 
It's like, that's not right. So we jump out, we go round the back and we open up the boot and both the dogs have opened the latches on the cages and got out, right? So bear in mind, so we've got we've got my uh, German Shepherd cross Dutch hair, bear in mind, he's 52 kilograms of dog, right? And then I've got a Belgian Malinois as well, right? So two of them to contend with. So my, my reaction was dive on them before they jump out and have someone. So I've dived on them and I've got them. His dog's biting my arm, right? <laughs> I've got my dog fighting with me. I'm trying to wrestle the two of them back into the cage. My brother stood there holding my belt off the back of this cab, right? With his arm on the side. And all the workers, I didn't quite realise, but when I got out and I actually got them back in, I got the, he pulled me out and we closed the lid. All the workers were stood looking at us like, you know, like, horrified at what they just saw. And I'm like, what the hell are they looking at? And then I realized all they seen was a guy's leg sticking out the back of a car, two dogs going absolutely crazy, the car rattling, and my brother's just... <laughs> you know, I was just like, oh, God. <laughs> Professionalism, zero. <laughs> I, could just, I could just imagine that. Like, and obviously, the, the, the moment you realize the dogs are loose... Like the fear of all of a sudden you're like, oh my god, like this, like this is a serious side to, to this job. That if a dog is loose, it's it in most cases, or in some cases, it is like the worst thing that could happen. And like, yes, yeah. I could just imagine the panic of these two loose dogs with workers around you, like, oh my god, and yeah, that like you say, you honestly, mate, my, my heart, heart literally, <laughs> you know. I was, it, it was gone. It's the, mo the moment I seen two two dogs' faces with no cage in front, I was like, "Uh oh." <laughs> but it is a, but a, that is a natural reaction that you do whatever it is to get hold of the dogs. And like you say, you, his dogs bite on your arm, but you just don't let go. You're like, "I cannot let go of this dog." And no. like, <laughs> I can just imagine. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm quite lucky. She likes me, so she went a bit soft on me. <laughs> So if if that's the if that's the funniest side, now I've spoken to you about <clears throat> different things, and this is some of the reasons why I brought you on. What is the worst moment you've had dog handling? Now I know you've had different incidents that happen, and if you want to talk for a couple of them, you can. Um, but what is the worst um, the worst moment you've had dog handling? The worst moments I've had dog handling. So I can't again. I can't um, name these certain individuals. But um, I had an incident with some certain individuals that came onto the site uninvited Why I was out on patrol. Um, when I come around the corner with the dog, uh, I noticed them coming in through the gate. They just forced entry through the gate. I then proceeded to challenge them as we, you know, as our job is, challenge them with the dog. They approached me, they got violent. Dog did his job. He kept them at bay. He kept them away from me. Um, that was when I had the shock of my life. Um, and well, I say it's not the shock of my life. I've had exper other experiences of this doing security, but I wasn't expecting it there. And then, especially in the place I was working, is um, one of them decided to pull a sawn off shotgun out and stick it in my face and then let one off next to my ear. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that was, um, that Pretty was a hairy moment. Put it well, put it this way as soon as I saw it, I turned round and threw my dog back in the van because I knew I knew straight away he said he might think about it, he might think about it doing it to me, but that dog's classed as property and he probably knows. And he said, he, He'll shoot my dog, no problem, he won't care. Yeah. So I it instantly got the dog away, locked the car, locked myself outside the car actually to protect the dog. Um, that's what you find yourself doing in this job. You spend more time protecting your dog than your dog does trying to like look after you. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I tried to obviously keep him safe. And to be honest, at that moment in time, I generally did think, I'm, that, yeah, this is it. They're going to kill me. Yeah. yeah. And when I, I shot, I actually went off, to, went off to my air, I actually thought they'd shot me. But that was out of nothing. It was obviously the dog, the dog, had the dog uh, protected you? Did, did you use the dog, or they you just used the dog to keep them away from you? No, I just no. At the end of the day, it's what it was. One of them. I just I kept them at bay. I kept them at bay. And as soon as that firearm came out, it's just like you are not killing my dog. 
Yeah, yeah. And it's back in. And and the and the other thing is as well as I as we you know me and you've talked about this before like the legalities of of, of using the dog, it, because it's so fraught with danger. And you know my opinion on it is, I'm no no man is going to get my dog put down. No scumbag is going to get my dog put down. I will put them away and go black and blue and get the crap beaten out of me and go toe to toe with someone before someone hurts my dog. Mm-hmm. But also what you also what you have to appreciate with this job is is there. There are parts of the job that are above your pay grade, and someone pulling a shotgun out on you is above your pay grade, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's not what it's not what you're trained for. And I've always taken that kind of look on it as well. Is that I'm trained to do certain stuff. If I'm not, I'm not trained to tackle someone with with a shotgun. So I'm not going to do it. It's it, that's above my pay grade. You just have to get the police and you have to yeah. obviously alert like, someone that's what's going on. You know what, the funny, the funny thing is, Joe, I actually completely agree with you. Um, we are not paid to deal with that. And by no means do I mean that you should get involved with anything. If you see someone with a firearm, run. Get in your car, go. Do not stick around. Um, but the thing is, is that you will find yourself, if you do this job long enough and you work in certain areas, you will find yourself being at the mercy of someone because you not you have no no way of dealing with that. You like it won't appear that at first. You know it'll be the case of oh I've had an alarm triggered. I'll go and see what it is. There's two guys stood there dressed in black. I've got to approach them and see what they're doing. You're completely alone. Yeah. You go and approach them. Something comes out of their jacket. Yeah. See you later. You're at their mercy. You know at the end of the day you are. You, you, and, if they feel that they want to let you live, then you'll live. But if they don't, you're screwed. Yeah. And that's, like I said, that's some of the serious side. This, like, obviously, why I wanted to get you. And you've um, you've also been in hospital with, um, with. am I correct, you got stabbed? Yeah. And, yeah, that's, yeah. and that's when you were saying earlier about, about body armour being the number one. That come off the back of, of this story of, uh, of you being stabbed, wasn't it? So yeah, um, that was really early on. Early on in my career, I was 18 years old. I was actually coming up. Funny, I probably shouldn't have been doing this. So disclaimer, naughty, naughty. Um, but I was, um, I was in the army at the time, and I was coming home on leave, and I, I, I was just doing shifts for a friend. I had my license, um, and I was picking up some extra money. So I was working on a, a site in Liverpool. I, you know, I'll tell you where it is. Obviously, I can't say exactly where it is, but in in uh, in Liverpool, and we had these really big, massive copper wires running through the site, and they were huge. Um, you know, just a chunk of this would fetch you so much money weighed in. Um, so that's what they, you know, people were trying to get in yeah. for. So I clocked two people uh, in when I was on shift that night, and I gave chase to them. I, I, I chased them off site and I'm called the police because I had confirmed that they were going equipped to steal. Right. So I had an indictable offense that they could be charged for. And it wasn't the first time they'd actually broke in either. So uh, I'm giving a report to the police. Police have come down, actually been in the area. They've caught one of them um, running down the way I said he was going, he was going and the other one just disappeared. Uh, I had no idea where he went. So, long story short, paperwork got done. I gave a report what of my recollection of what happened, whether they've been in before, and I can identify them. And I say, so the police were quite happy with that. They took that away. He actually got charged. Um, but his friend, who disappeared, um, when I finished shift that morning and handed over to the other guard, I walked outside, Bear in mind, this is about six in the morning. So, you know, it's it's starting to get light, light at this point, nearly. I'm so, so stood outside having a cigarette before I start making my way, um, making my way home. And someone comes up behind me and I said, a whack. And I was like, what the? You know, like I thought someone had just booted me in the back. Um, and I've turned around and it was him. It was the one that disappeared. Um, been waiting for you. Yeah, been waiting for me. Um, so I've turned around and thought, you look, you know, I'm not going to lie. I generally turned around and went, you know, you little t- <laughs> when, when to get them. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, you get angry, especially if someone punches you or you mm-hmm. think you've been punched. 
Um, so I went to move and then that's that's when it hit me as soon as I went to put my foot forward. I felt a sharp pain in my back. I felt wetness coming down down the lower half, lower half of it and I was wondering what was going on. I said, why can't I move? I've put my hand back and there's, there was something sticking out on my back. Um, and then obviously other guards come out seeing me um, lucky enough, the the other guard was a ex army battlefield med tech. Nice. So straight away he knew what happened and he was on it and he he was dealing with me. Um, he got the ambulance there, pretty quick. I I, I would I still at this point, you know, when he's dealing with me, I still don't know what actually happened to me. All I know is that I can feel something in my back. Um, you know, I ended up going to the hospital. They got removed. And uh, basically, it was one. Do you know, do you know the mini samurai sword? You know, they, they, they come in sets, like uh, yeah. wakashashi, I think they're called. Mm-hmm. It was one of them. Oh. Yeah, one of them. Um, and the only reason it didn't kill me is it got caught in the fibers in my jacket. Oh, how lucky is that? How lucky is that? Yeah. But yeah, the, the, but that's an imp- but that's an important part of understanding this job as well. Is that revenge? These people will revenge attack and it might not be it might be you deal with an instant on site one day but they may wait two three days and they'll come back so that that story just goes to prove that these people do hold grudges even though even though you haven't done anything to them or or you've stopped them from maybe getting their money but you haven't done anything to them but these people will revenge attack these people do hold grudges and these people are that dangerous that they will do something like that to someone who's done no harm to them whatsoever. Yeah, see, the, this is the thing that people like don't sort of understand when they come into the security industry. If you look at the definition of what we do, our job is to deal with criminals. That is what we're paid to do. We're paid to stop crime and enforce the law if necessary. Right? We're also a big one on health and safety. We're there to take care of people's health and safety. We have a duty of care to the public. We have a duty of care to anyone on the site. That's including the person that we're dealing with. And you tend to forget that when you think about these things. So, like, it's it's hard to put it into words. It's like it, criminals don't change just because they're coming onto a site and trying to break into somewhere. Mm-hmm. There are criminals out there that will try and kill a police officer. That what... What do you think they're going to do to me and you? Yeah, they've got no worries about you, have they? No. And, you you know, if you do this job long enough, you will bump into them people. I've had several occasions where I've bumped into them people. Um, and it will happen. And you've got to be prepared for it. And you've got to be yeah. ready for it. That's why, you know, I said <laughs> with the kit thing, body armor. Because that there's just that one thing, that little investment could mean you're walking away. Yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that's it. Even even to even to me, obviously, I, 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 you said about it before. We've never really gone into detail with it, but that just opens up your eyes. And like you say, th- these people won't think twice about killing a, a police officer. So just because you've got security on your on your hat and and a dog by your side, it doesn't really change a lot of stuff. And like you say, with the with the first one with a shotgun, like there's nothing you can do. No, there's you 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 are helpless at that point. And you may be a couple of miles from the nearest person or you, you may be so far away that no one's going to find out for, for a fair amount of time. And like you say, it's, it, that's how dangerous this job can be. That's where, um, obviously, I know you watched my um, duty bag video. That's why I carry a trauma kit Yeah, and a cat tourniquet. It's not for anyone else, it's for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, 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 you pretend it's for other people. But at the end of the day, it's for you. That's sort of the downside. So what's the most satisfying moment you've had dog handling? So obviously there's the funny side. We've had the serious side. But what what would you say is um, is the most satisfying moment you've had dog handling? Um, well, there's, there's been a couple. Um, I think one of the satisfying moments um, is getting to... It was a weird one. It was getting to work with the police. Um, and it wasn't when I was working, if this to sound strange, I was actually on my way home from, from work and the police had cordoned off my street <laughs> that I lived on. Um, so I've pulled up thinking, 
why can't I, you know, my house is down there. You know what I mean? I, I need to get down there. And they said, oh, we've got to wait. There's a, that we've put a cordon on because we've got a potential um, criminal who's, who's stabbed someone in this, in this area. And we, obviously they're doing a the search. And he said, oh, I, I said to him, I said, um, I've got a dog that can track. I'm a security dog handler. Do you want me, do you want an assistance? And they were like, they actually radioed it in. And I got the green light. They literally, <laughs> they just went, they literally just went, yeah, get the dog out. If you, I said, where was he last? Showed me where he was last. Dog tracked him, tracked him all the way to the front door. When he came to the front door and answered the door, when the police knocked, dog indicated. It was just like that. That's good enough for us. Nick him. <laughs> did, you, did, did, did you charge him? Did you invoice him? Did the charge? Oh, nah. I, I, mate, to, mate, to get... To, Honestly, to get the, the opportunity to bust on someone's door when he comes to the door, goes, stand still, go to the dog. You know? <laughs> Security officer with the dog, stand still. <laughs> you know? Proper giving it, giving it the beans, even though the coppers are still behind me, like, yeah, they've got tasers. <laughs> 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 but that's, but that's, that's something that you don't get to do. So I've, I've said this in a, in a video before that, you, you'd think that going into security dog handling would be like a step on the ladder to becoming a, a police dog handler because you would see the police dog handler and probably like an army dog handler as like the pinnacle of, of our industry as such. But from what I've heard, that if you've got previous training, let's say a NASDU, um, a NASDU certificate or anything like that, I've heard that the police won't take you on because you've got previous training because they wanted you to be raw and do it the way that they want you to do it. You can't move from security into police. That's because, um, so basically, yeah, you're right. It, it, that is quite true. Um, and it depends. It, it's, it's how they do things. So with their dogs, I, I'm not saying the police don't care about the dogs before anyone says, but with their dogs, it's a conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. Dog does this so many times, fails once, it's gone. Yep. Next one comes in. New handler, new dog. That that's how they work. So they have a set standard. If that dog doesn't meet that required standard in minimum amount of time, it's gone. It's gone. Um, whereas us, we will spend years to perfect our dog, and we will take the time to yeah. think. Because we, with us, we we become invested in our dogs. Our, our dogs are, are part of our family. Whereas the police's sort of idea is it's a tool. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I've heard about that, and and sometimes as a security dog handler, you can pick up these um, police dogs that have fouled, and they'll they because they, they, when you say that they're out, they'll probably sell them dogs as sort of part trained dogs, and they'll go down to the security industry, um, and I know people that have got dogs that have fouled um, sort of the prison uh, sector of it, where they, they can't have them in the in the prison, so. Uh, security dog handlers have picked them dogs up as they've come out so that is a, that is another route and if you if you want to get started straight away in in this that's that's a route to go down where you can pick them dogs up and then start your nasdu straight away because the dog is more or less going to pass its nasdu it, just because it fails the police the police have a higher standard than the nasdu have so when them dogs come out them dogs will more or less be ready to to go through their nasdu and then it's just a case of training yourself up and doing your hours. So that is another route that you can go down. How you come across them dogs, I'm not 100% sure. I'm sure they're not just advertised on like a website. I'm sure the, the, there is a route that you go down to, to pick them dogs up. But that is, a, that is a good route to go down if you want to get started straight away. Or if your, something happens to your dog and you need a dog straight away and one of them comes available, then you just pick them up and, and just carry on, don't you? Yeah, well, it's a thing is with them as well is that um, if security dog handlers didn't take them, you'll actually find that a lot of uh, constabularies, um, if they have dogs that have failed, pardon, scouse accent, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, if they have dogs that failed, they will often actually approach security companies um, because they know that dog can't go to a normal home. It can't go into yeah. a normal um, existence as a pet. It has, to, it has to be worked. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the time you'll find that if we don't take these dogs, um, they'll probably end up being euthanized. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 
And a lot of them, because uh, I, it's, I believe that police dogs and army dogs, they, they work until they're about nine. And then it's either the dog, the dog stays with um, the handler like, and lives with the handler, or these dogs normally, like you say, get, get euthanized because they're just too dangerous to give to a member of the public or, or anything like that. So it's kind of like the dog's working lifespan is about nine, is about nine years. And then after that, if the handler can't take the dog on, like you say, it normally gets put down and, and then it's, uh, it's on to the next one, isn't it? So it's, it's quite a cutthroat kind of, kind of business at the high end where obviously we have our dogs and we live with our dogs for so long and we train them that basically when they get to the age that we, the age that we feel they can't do the job anymore, they just then become sort of like house pets or like as much as they can be. You just, you try and take it out of them a little bit, but if the dog's still willing to do the job, then obviously you can still work it, but you'll know, I've heard that you'll know a time where you think, like well, this dog is, is, is too, is too old for it now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, at the end of the day, like a lot of guys want to retire the dogs early because, like, for example, like if I would like to retire him early. I'd probably like to retire him when he's about seven because I want him to have a life. Mm. He's worked hard. Yeah, he's made yeah. me money. He's made, he's, he, you know, at the end of the day, he, he comes to work with me, he works with me. He's, he deserves a life of Riley to, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I think the I mean, dogs. That's... Sorry, go on. No, I think the, I think the dogs. Um, you know, like don't get enough appreciation from the public or from from just the general, you know, the general life is they don't people don't realize what these dogs go through, mm-hmm. um, and like us, you know, the abuse we get as security officers, they get it too because they're right next to us, you know. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's I've said I've, I've said to I've said to the girlfriend and that I think from the age so he's going to be free in March. I would say from probably the age of four and a half five if a dog becomes a, if a puppy becomes available i'll get it like I've, I've got that kind of barrier that four and a half when he's four and a half five if a puppy becomes available that's when i'll start looking but i'll probably get one when he's before he's six so that like you say you can get a good 18 months two years of training into the dog and sort of then work them side by side and then it comes to the point where i say okay like you're seven eight now you stay at home or if he comes to work, I'll get him out, do like some patrols. But this, the new one that comes in is like the main dog. And, but he gets to come with us because I, I still feel like, I know you said like you're seven, you want him to have a life and that, but also what I wouldn't want to do is then start going to work and leaving him at home because he'll be thinking like, well, why am I not coming anymore? So sometimes it's a case of taking him with you and doing like some walks and patrols, but you know that if the if the crap hits the fan, the new dog comes out, and he's the one that takes over. You, you you just take some you just take some of the responsibility off the dog, and like slow him down, slow him down. And then obviously there will be a time where you're like, you know what, your mum your mum needs you at home. You stay here. Me and the, me and the other <laughs> yeah. one are gonna go, and then that's- look after him that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. Obviously, when when he's at home, he, he is his mummy's boy. You know, I'm yeah. not gonna lie. Yeah, um, he, he, if I if even I'm a slightly bit aggressive towards my missus, he lets me know about yeah, it. Yeah, I had that uh, the other day. I was messing around with the missus, and I was I was I gave her a slap on the ass, the dog, and he come over <laughs> and he just he, gave, he put his mouth around. He didn't bite. He put his mouth around and looked at me as if to say, "Yeah, you carry on doing that. You're gonna know what's going on." <laughs> I, think that's, uh, yeah, I, I think that's an important thing to remember as well is that with these dogs although my dog lives free does your dog live free around the house yes yes yeah the, the important thing is is that if you if you have people around or you and the girlfriend are having a tickle fight or whatever it is or like your mates come around and they have a couple of beers and they start getting a bit rowdy you have to be careful with this because my, one of my mates might get a bit rowdy after a couple of beers and you pretend to have a bit of a wrestle on the floor. My dog doesn't understand the difference between having a little drunk wrestle on the floor and someone attacking you. So you have to be careful with that as well. With that, and that's why I've always said, like, the commands are so important and making sure you have them commands down that you can just say, no, it's all right, dog. The only problem is, is that even if you say, no, it's all right, dog, he's still going to be interested and get excited about it. Sorry, he's freaking, he's here now. I, 
Stop it. <laughs> what what are you doing? <laughs> So if you um if you if you could change one thing in dog handling, what is the one thing you would change? If I could well it's it's hard to say one thing really, but I suppose the one thing to change that would probably change most things in the industry would be make Nasdu Nipto Bipta one stop fighting each other, stop doing this this argue with bitchiness we've got amongst the industry where everyone's I'm better than you or we're trained differently or we're trained better than you. It's like, guys, you should be working together because it's you guys against everyone else. You know what I mean? It's us versus the public because public opinion and how the public perceives us is going to be what makes the difference between us going to Nick when we're in, we're in, we're in court trying to explain our actions and why our dogs did what they did in the worst circumstances. So you so you just like to see like one governing body rather than like two or three where you feel like people like different dog handlers from these different sections. So like I'm Nasdu and you're Nipju or what and in in some cases, obviously not between me and you, that I would say, well, Nasdu's better than Nipju, so I must be a better dog handler than you. Or you'll turn yeah. around and say, No, in Nipju we do this, so that means I'm better than you because you're you're trained as Nasdu. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I didn't like, like my, my, my trainer, Richard, God love him, uh, Richard Timms, um, God love him, he, he passed away a few months ago. Um, and he, I only trained with him um, for the my entire time I've been in the industry. And Richard, from day one, was point blank with me. And that's what I loved about him. And that's why I said he was such a good trainer. It's that he turned around and said, you can do everything by the book. You can do everything I teach you to the letter you will walk away but your dog will probably get put down yeah yeah no no, no and that is the truth and that's when i when the reason that i'm with uh, the trainer i've got now terry is that they will tell you that that kind of stuff they won't sugarcoat it in a in a different way they he tells me exactly the same way he tells you how it is and uh, that and that's why it's important to find a good trainer and not listen but no one tells you that on YouTube. Like no one no, tells you anything no. about. It. They're not. No one's ever going to tell you. So that's why it's good to get this, get that message out through this. Or and it's important that trainers tell people. And I'm sure a lot of trainers do. Is that trainers tell new handlers and existing handlers exactly how it is, and don't try and sugarcoat it. Because if you sugarcoat it, that is when accidents happen or incidents happen that shouldn't. Because the new handler feels untouchable and then they do something stupid and then the dog has to be euthanized. They're like, well, I didn't realise that was going to happen. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, it's just a bad, it's a bad part of this industry. Um, for example, you know, I, I, again, I'm not blaming all trainers. I'm not tarnishing everyone with the same brush. But what you've got to remember is with trainers is you pay their bills. Mm. Are they going to tell you that what they're teaching you will potentially get your dog killed? So now this is uh, a point where I'm going to open the floor to you. This is uh, a section just where you can pick a topic that we can talk about or you can pick a topic that you want to express your opinions on or let people know about. So is there, is there anything that you specifically want to talk about for a couple of minutes? Well, um, well, there's a, there's a lot to talk about in the security industry. Where do, where, where do I begin um, with the with the wrongs that have that happen in this job? Um, I think one of the biggest ones I, I wanted to put out there. Now, again, guys, it's one of that I'm no legal. You know, I'm no lawyer. You know what I mean? I'm no legal representative. Um, I'm, me and you have spoke about this before. Actually, I've mentioned it uh, mentioned it to you, Michael. Um, the stuff you get taught in your training, when you get taught that the dog is there to protect you, or people tell you to do, um, obviously, protection of handler, and you get training records to say dog is, is achieving protection of handler. In UK law, dogs are classed as property. Mm -hmm. So the class is an object. Now, any object purchased for the purpose of self-defence or modified for the purpose of self-defense, hence trained, um, is an offensive weapon. Now, 
most people will go, oh, well, no, that can't be right. But what you've got to remember is, is that, obviously, our dogs can't bite. And when they do bite, nine times out of ten, it's a bad result for us, even if it's the worst circumstances. There's a reason for that. Because it's an offensive weapon. And as soon as you turn around and say, my dog is trained to protect me, you've prepared for self-defense. You've got something, purchase something for the purpose of self-defense. So now you've admitted to com committing an indictable offense. Hmm. And that's where I think a lot of people are actually ending up in front of a court and getting charged in this job because they don't quite understand that part of it. Now, yeah. on the other hand of things, like the other side of things, you could also look at the fact is of the dog is not there to protect you. However, the dog that is there to assist you in the location of a potential criminal element on any licensed premises, right? Is the dog trained to bite? Yes, he is. Because due to the nature of our work, he's trained to bite to defend himself because he has the right to. He's a living thing. He's an animal. He has the right to defend himself, yeah. right? He's trained to bite arm true because he needs to control be in a controlled manner when he defends himself to minimize injury to the person who's attacking him because we still have a duty of care to them yeah right? so you take all this into context and if the dog is not there to protect you however in the heat of the moment it does state in uk law that you may pick up a object and use it as an improvised weapon in, in self-defense the dog is an object. You use the dog in self-defense yeah. in that situation because you truly believed that your life was at risk. Now, when it comes to self-defense law, when you go into court, they can't argue that's what you believed. They can't argue self-defense. Self-defense is an all-round all -round protection, basically. When you go into court, is that whether it's a judge and a barrister or whether it's a judge, barrister and a jury, Right. they've got to prove that you did not believe you were in danger, yeah. even and if that, you were wrong. Yeah, and that's obviously hard to do because you can't you can't tell what someone else was thinking, if, especially if you're not there. You can't tell what that person was thinking at the moment that a certain thing happened. So, yeah, that's that, that, like I say that's that's quite interesting. That and I think that to be fair, I think that's a little bit of the difference between not our training, not our training, but the way in which we've both been taught differently. So, we the way I was taught is that the dog is there for your protection, where you say that the dog is there to protect itself. You just happen to be there. Well, no, basically. So I'm not saying the dog. The dog is taught to protect itself due to the nature of our job. My job as a security officer puts me in direct contact with criminals, right? So I have to know how to defend myself. The dog has to know how to defend itself because of the risk factor, right? Otherwise, it would be animal cruelty and walking the dog into danger without giving it proper training to deal with that danger. Now, the thing I'm saying is the dog is there for a purpose. He's there to detect and indicate. Mm -hmm. We're there to deal with what he finds. However, in the circumstances, if I felt my life was threatened, I could use my dog in self-defense. Yeah, I get that. Do you do, because um, I know a lot of people do, do you do anything outside um, outside work, whether that be like uh, judo, karate? Is there any, like, do you do, like, because I know, like, my trainer is, like, quite, is quite high up or was quite high up in judo so obviously using in 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 an attack you could use the other person's body weight against themselves and things like that. is there anything that you do um currently at the moment no i, I do train in the gym quite a lot um, i exercise quite a lot um but um so some of the martial arts i have done in the past i've done uh, i started off boxing um taught by my dad when i was younger and um, basically that was sort of the idea of if you want to learn how to fight, get in the ring with someone who knows what they're doing and get the crap beaten out of you. If you still stood at the end of it, you can fight because you can take a hit and give one back. Um, after that, um, I spent some time, obviously I spent some time in the military. So I did different things in the military, self-defense, hand-to-hand -hand combat. I also did Krav Maga for a number of years. Um, it's effective, but in regards to what we do for a living, too aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, 
because the aim of Krav Maga is to cause maximum damage in as short as amount of time yeah. um, to allow you to escape danger. Whereas in our job, if you cause maximum damage, you're going to answer for that damage in court, um, which is unfortunate because usually we're the ones getting attacked and that's why we've inflicted the maximum damage, yeah. but that's how it goes, unfortunately. Um, the best advice I can give to anyone if they're thinking about self-defense is uh, judo or jiu-jitsu because you're not striking a person, you're using that person's body weight against them. And if you can lock someone up and manipulate someone and get them tired before you are, you'll find that you'll you'll find the job easier because you won't be panicked as much. Because you know, if you know you're about to go into a confrontation with someone, you know they're going to be a hothead and you know they're going to throw a punch. You're just like, yep, you throw that punch because they're going to wrap you up as soon as you do. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So you know you know that person is going to come to attack you does the hothead. You know that they're not thinking clearly and maybe using something like the judo just slows down your thinking and slows down everything with you so that you don't react in that quick hot-headed manner as well you kind of take your time and just slow everything down and that's and that i think that's a good thing about judo not that i do it i've done it as a kid but i think with with that side of judo is that you wouldn't panic and be, it wouldn't become a wrestle it would be a case of like okay he's going to do that i'll just do flip him over on his face job yeah, yeah. And, and you know that it's it, it people don't realize it realize the devastation of that it's like, so you get punched by someone, it hurts, but it may not knock you out and it may not knock you down, right? If someone launches you up in the air and then slams your full body weight into a concrete floor, you're going to feel it yeah, and you're yeah. probably not getting back up. <laughs> All right. um, I'm speaking so from experience there because my brother's done that to me. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been quite something if bring it coming up in boxing with 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 brothers did you used to fight each other is that is that one of the ways that you sort of learned it you had a fight with yeah. each other yeah uh, me and my biggest my biggest brother dan um we were always sort of like the main competitors of trevor obviously me being the smallest and being the biggest he's like six foot five out here somewhere um and obviously i'm six foot exactly um, so he's a bit bigger than me. He's a lot, lot, lot more broader than me. I'll give him that. Um, so me and him always went toe to toe with each other in boxing, and then it went into like uh, doing like a little bit of MMA. We got in the cage together and went at each other a couple of times. Uh, he dislocated my shoulder in one of them, and uh, I got him back by breaking his ankle. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so yeah it's, got, so it's good that it's, it's good that you don't do it anymore then <laughs> yes <laughs> so just one of the last few things have you uh do you have any advice for any new handlers or aspiring handlers like obviously there's loads of advice you could give but yeah. is there a couple of key points that you could give new handlers or aspiring handlers about about dog handling yeah, um, one of well, first one, watch your channel. That would be my first one. Watch your channel, understand the job. Um, I'd advise that as well. I'd, I'd advise you watch it three times. Yeah. So, yeah, watch the channel. Watch, take notes and learn from what you see and, and realise how the job works. Also, make sure you've got some security experience before you go walking into the, into the dog world. Um, because if you've got no security experience, whether you're in for a, a culture shock, um, on what you're expected to do, the people you're expected to deal with, with very min minimal resources to do it with. Um, and the other one, the last one would be PPE invest in PPE, make sure body armor, whether it's body armor or just, just like a piece of clothing that's slash proof or anything, just protect yourselves. Because no one's going to do it for you. You've got to do it for yourself. Once. Yeah, and as I was saying earlier, you're kind of the guy for that. And down in the description of this video, I'll put your Instagram, uh, UK Security 101. You, you, you're happy. Uh, I sent you uh, a guide to you the other day about boots, etc. You're happy for people to to direct message you and ask you about this stuff, and 
you'll help them out in terms of giving them the right kind of equipment or like advising them on what equipment to get and, and things like that. So what, down in the description, be your Instagram, direct message you with any questions and obviously you'll, you'll do as much as you can to, to sort of help them. Yeah, of course. I'm, I'm always happy to help guys. As I said, the whole point of me starting up this channel, um, I did get a bit of inspiration from yourself, uh, Michael. Um, watching you do it and actually speaking to you actually kind of gave me a little bit of a boot up the ass, <laughs> as yeah. I've been saying I could do it for a couple of years. But um, yeah, the aim of my channel, guys, is just to show you kit and equipment that I use um, that you can buy for not a lot of money that will make the job easier, but it'll also be proficient in what it needs to do. And it's going to also keep you safe. And that's the main yeah. thing. We want to keep you guys safe. Yeah. And, uh, and 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 I'm I'm happy that you start. You've seen that you've obviously seen my channel and got a bit inspired and thought, well, I don't want to do the same thing, but I can go down this route. And that's that's why I've kind of got you on. And I hope that people that obviously watch my channel go kind of down your route and say, well, I'll specialise in this kind of area or I'll do this. And rather, and I hope that people do it the right way and I've seen obviously what I've spoken to you and obviously everyone's seen this video now you you obviously know what you're talking about you're a very knowledgeable guy and I feel like you're going to make really good content and I just hope that people that watch your channel will get inspired and say oh he specializes in a certain area so maybe I could specialize in this kind of area well oh, Michael you're going to make me blush you said I know what I'm doing <laughs> <laughs> But I think, but like I say, I think there, there is room for, for different people. There's there's room for people to do what I do because I'm never going to pretend that I know everything. And I feel like there's people that can that can make vi good videos, that people that can bring good knowledge doing exactly what I do. But I just want it to be done the right way. And a lot of people said that, they, that I'm like the first one to try and do it. So I'm kind of break into what you can and can't kind of share and it might be the, the next person or the one after that that really dials down into making really, really good videos and having like a production thing behind them kind of stuff. Because but I, but I think this comes with a job is a lot of mine is is kind of just me and my camera. And I think that's where you'll get the authentic kind of look at the job is that it's just me, the dog and the camera. It's like there's no bells and whistles. I don't have a production team turn up to a site so <laughs> yeah. I can make this like five, 10 minute video. And like I say, and I appreciate saying to watch my videos because you do get a good, a good view on like the raw side of the, uh, the, the kind of job, because I was actually looking back at some of my earlier videos and like the how much video. Now, if you go back and watch the, if someone goes and watch that, how much video you think like how amateur is this video? Like I'm sitting in my car at like 10 o'clock at night in the middle of February with my torch trying to do this video. And some people you say, well, how amateur is this video? But if you actually look at it properly, that is that is the, the reality of the job. And normally I wouldn't even sit there with the torch on. You're literally just sitting there in the pitch black, can't even see the sandwich you're trying to put in your mouth. <laughs> yeah. But, that, but that, is, that is the reality of this job. See the thing is the thing is though, Michael. Um, obviously, you know my boss. My boss uh, follows you, and um, me, me and my boss said the same thing when we both found out that we both follow you. Is that we we love you because you're honesty. Mm. That you you I can relate to you 100. percent When I watched your first few videos, when I first found your channel, and I watched your video, and I watched you sitting in the dark with the torch in your van, I was just like, I've been there. <laughs> I've been there. I, I think every, I think everyone that is. <laughs> yeah, everyone that is a dog handler will look at that and think, well, at least he's got his torch on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at least he's got a torch. Yeah, at least he's got a torch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is uh, my closing question. This is a question that I'll ask every handler that I have on to this. And it is, if you could change the way that you dealt with a situation, what situation would that be? So is there a situation that you feel you felt that you didn't deal with properly? Um, is there a situation that got out of hand that maybe you could have you could have gone out a different way? Um, that's uh, that's actually a difficult one to answer. I mean, there's there have been such I suppose I suppose kind of um, the what the incident I spoke of earlier with with obviously that having the gun pressed to my with head. The shotgun. Yeah, I suppose. As bad as it sounds, 
I suppose as soon as I seen them, I should have just run. Yeah. And I'm not, you know, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I, I'm no Superman. I've been in the military. I, I, I know what it's like to be in danger, but I'm no Superman when you're going up against an armed opponent with nothing. You wish you'd just got in the car and, and left. I wish I wish I'd have just gone, mate. I do. I wish I'd have just gone. And in all honesty, if I had got in that car, I'd have probably ran them over on the way out. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. so is that, that self defence? Uh, yeah, actually, because it's matching deadly force with deadly force, <laughs> and you can't get done. For, and you can't get done for me, done for uh, murder using a vehicle. Really. No, you can only no because it's a road traffic act offence. <laughs> so you can't get them from him. <laughs> can we can we just put a fee out there? We do not advise that you start running people over just because they've got something in. Their I know head. too much stuff about law. I've been around police officers way too many times. Okay. <laughs> um, Aaron, Aaron, that's been great. And I, I, I'm sure this video is going to come out really well. Um, I've really enjoyed talking to you. Like I say, we've spoke before, but not really gone into lots of detail. And the moment you started telling me some of the stories, I was like, other people need to hear this. And I really appreciate uh, you staying up. I mean, you was on a 14-hour shift and finished, what, three hours ago? So you've been up a long time. So I will, we'll leave it there. Um, like I say, in the description, I'll put your Instagram and people can get in contact with you. But it's UK Security 101. And obviously you've got your channel as well. I'll put the channel link down there for people to go on um, where they obviously can watch your videos and it's going to be lots of product stuff. And I appreciate you coming on. And I know you're in a lot of the lives that I do on a Wednesday. You're in a lot of them where you can give your, your side to sort of stuff and answer questions as well. So you are going to be, you, well, you are a good part of this channel and you, you are someone that gets involved a lot. So um, I appreciate you and I appreciate your time. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's been great, mate. Thank you. You're welcome, Michael. And uh, again, thank you for having me on, mate. I was your first one. I popped, I popped, I popped you an interview, Cherry. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just, well, that's the thing. I'm sure that I'm sure I'm, I'm going to have you on again and we'll, we'll chat about some other stuff and things like that. So, yeah. So guys, if, uh, if you like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up, go down to the description, UK security 101 and, uh, speak to Aaron like I say very knowledgeable if there's anything in this video put it down in the comments subscribe to the to the channel and we'll see you again next time cheers for watching guys see you later bye and cut